It is my pleasure to introduce Sir Stephen Tyndall from Pure Advantage, who will be moderating this terrific panel. Kia ora, Stephen. Yes, hi, hi everybody. I just wanted to start off by thanking everybody who's left <laughs> um, for your participation, for coming along, and for all you do for us in New Zealand. I think it's you know, a great collection over the last couple of days of people that are willing to actually put their, their shoulders to the wheel and make things happen. So to everybody, thank you so much. Um, I just want to give you a, a little bit of a um, background of the things I've got involved in before we talk to the, to the panel. Um, I've always tried to uh, treat everybody with unconditional respect all my life, and what I've found um, so far in the last two days is that it, generally that's what's been happening. We do have our differences. Um, there are people that you know do support just um, exotic plantations for carbon only. But I think we do, as Kiwis, all respect each other. And the key thing is that we continue to do that to make this country a great place. Uh, I, I actually uh, hosted a few people from Austria around about 12 years ago in Auckland. And they were foresters. And some of them told me that they were families that had been around since before Christ. So, you know, well over 2,000 and, and say 30 years, these forests have been going. And those people were nurturing these forests and making a very good living out of it, mainly through a little bit like we, what we saw with Totara in the North Island, uh, by selectively logging, but normally with helicopters. So these living forests can go on for forever and ever, really. Some of the things I've been involved in through uh, our Tyndall Foundation uh, is Tane's Tree Trust, we've supported for years. Um, I had a light bulb moment in the shower one day and decided that I'd like to really put some money behind tree planting, and so we, we started Trees That Count uh, and <clears throat> got Project Crimson to help us do that. Uh, we started a thing called Reconnecting Northland probably 15 years ago now, and um, we've used a lot of the wood in some of the funding we do around affordable housing. So, and then we've had like hundreds and hundreds of local environmental projects that we do through our funding managers all over the country. In terms of my involvement with venture capital, also we've invested in a number of things. So in, in forestry, I, I was really taken aback by the number of logs that were going out of the country without any added value. And so we invested in a company called WET, Wood Engineering Timber. Uh, we built one plant already in Gisborne, the second plant's being built now, and we've got plans to build another 14 of those. And that takes a, a bare, low-grade pulp log using robotics, turns it into engineered glued lamp timber. And a lot of that timber we've been using in the affordable housing. And it's, this, it's high demand and it will change the way we build houses in the future because you use a lot less of that timber than you do raw timber. Um, the other thing is, um, I think what we've been talking about the last two days is actually investing for the long haul. And so most of, most of my investment, I'm looking sort of at least 10, 20, 30 years out. If I go back to the, the first warehouse store that I started, you know, where first day sales were like $500, and now we do, we're doing three and a half billion a year. That was kind of a trajectory of a very long-term investment. And the same things happen with things that we've invested in, like Lanza Tech and Rocket Lab. We're also trying to in, invest in things that change land use. So we're already in one oat milk uh, factory, and we're looking to start up another one in Southland in the near future. We've invested in plant-based food to do the same sort of thing, and also fermentation for different types of cheeses. Over the years, since a little guy, I've found that forests are my happy place, and so I get into them as much as I can and, and, and walk most of the great walks. I was incredibly impressed yesterday by the catchment group panel. Um, the, the things that we've learned, I think, in the last two days have been amazing. And in that one, for me, I was so pleased to hear the collaboration and cooperation going on between farmers. We've invested in Toha, and you heard Natalie today, um, we see that as a, a real icebreaker uh, for using data to actually bring money into the system to be able to help us grow more. And I've put a lot of money into solar and 
more recently into hydrogen. So a busy time, busy life, and it's been an awful lot of fun. And the same goes for these guys on the stage. So I'm going to get them to introduce themselves each and talk a little bit about what they, their background is and what they do, and then we'll move into some questions. Kia ora everybody, um, my name's Ben Tyus and I work for Environment Canterbury, that's the Canterbury Regional Council, and I am a, yeah, the forester. Um, we manage kind of a 3,000 hectare forestry estate, um, just on the land that was in down to us for flood protection and soil conservation surrounding the Braider Rivers, so back in the day the land was given to us and we planted up willows and we planted up poplars and we planted up radiata pine and got people to put stop banks around the rivers to control them to, you know, protect infrastructure. And um, now those forests kind of serve a whole lot more value. Uh, we've got the regional parks in there, so we've got a mountain biking, you know, horse tracks, walking, all of those kind of values. Um, there's carbon sequestration, there's um, log value coming from those from harvest, and there's also, um, yeah, a lot more pressure on diversifying that forest, which is um, thanks to all the people out there and the councillors that want to try and make that change because, uh, you know, we're on the Canterbury Plains and we've got less than 0.05% left uh, indigenous remnant vegetation. So we're trying to address that. Um, we're not in a place for kind of natural regeneration to occur. We're, we, we actually need quite a bit of planting effort there. So... Um, yeah, I'm trying to bridge that gap, I guess, um, in a forest management sense. We've got a little biodiversity team and uh, a biodiversity ranger, and they're going around. They traditionally get a small budget, and they're doing real intensive restoration plantings here and there. I'm trying to bridge the gap between hardcore ecology purity and commercial forestry techniques to accelerate that. Um, we want to get mountains to see biodiversity corridors functioning like how Colin Merck was talking about it um, earlier today. Um, so, yeah, kind of feeling a bit empowered to try diff different techniques, work with people like Colin, work with people like Adam Forbes and, you know, um, yeah, Mike from Tane's Tree Trust, show them around all these different ideas to try and increase nat native afforestation and, you know, make that appealing to all the people up the chain as well. Um, how can we get value for that? How is that going to um, be a real good benefit for our region? Um, and how do we accelerate that? So um, it's a pretty awesome space to be in. I'm in that operational planning space, but I also go up the chain as well, um, trying to sell these ideas, working with um, you know, directors, working with council, working with um, people that come to us because they know that we've got a significant land holding and they want to plant up our land. <laughs> you know, the public land, and um, yeah, for various various different interests. Some of those might be, um, you know, maybe a license to pollute, some of them might be mutual interests, but um, yeah, I've had, I've had some further thoughts that I might touch on a little bit later about public-private partnerships and ways to address those, um, permanent forestry, um, you know, anxieties and stuff that people might have around those, um, but all for the better of our Nahiri in the future. Got it. Thanks very much, Ben. And Ian, the, the star of the video. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, Ian Brennan. Um, <clears throat> I was in IT for 22 years, and in 22 years of work, I never ever produced anything that I could pick up and turn around and show somebody and say, look, I created that. And so I got sick of that. And, and when we moved, I, I was in Edinburgh for 18 years, um, and then working, working for um, an insurance company. And when we came back to New Zealand, I was determined to do something different. So um, anyway, we ended up buying, uh, we were looking at lifestyle blocks and I realized that if we bought a farm, I could avoid having to get a job. So that's how I ended up as a farmer. And then a year later, I was, um, I, I realized how steep, you know, my, the scales fell from my eyes and I, and I realized we'd bought a dunger, um, <laughs> invested our life savings in, in um, a block of pretty crappy steep land. Um, and realised that it would be great to put it back into, into native forest. I never, it just never occurred to me that I'd want to put it in pines, not that I've got anything against them, but I just, you know, I love, I love the bush. Um, but I couldn't, have, couldn't figure out how we could ever afford it. And 17 years later, with a lot of um, grant help and a lot of um, 
emotional and uh, technical help from Tane's Tree Trust. Uh, you've seen, you know, we're on the way to have, having planted all of the steep land, which is about 35 hectares so far and um, about another four to go. Um, and, you know, every day is different and I, I'm enjoying the journey. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Ian. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll go with Annabelle. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we'll switch it around a bit. <laughs> Kia ora everyone, um, Annabelle Chartis. I lead uh, PwC Sustainability and Climate Change Practice. So um, for those of you who don't know who PwC is, it's a, it's a large professional services firm. So in terms of what I do, it's essentially helping clients, um, uh, both public and private sector um, organisations, to, to navigate and to think about all sorts of stuff under that enormous banner of sustainability and climate change. And that can be uh, anything from helping them figure out what a sustainability strategy might look like for their organisations to how they might navigate or think about um, carbon revenue to, to meet emissions obligations under the emissions trading scheme, um, to looking at the commercial viability of, of alternative proteins in New Zealand. So it's a very, very broad church of, of things that we're, we're helping New Zealand with. Um, one of the biggest focused areas, though, probably at the moment, is really driven by um, the, the mandatory disclosure that's coming into New Zealand around climate-related risks and opportunities. And what's been really interesting um, today and yesterday is that of the, the two themes that I see coming through, the first one being there's a real need for everybody to work together, paddle the waka together, we're in this together, um, and that that's the only way we're going to, to solve solutions. The second big theme that, that has been coming through with a lot of the speakers is that this is bigger than just a climate and carbon conversation. Um, now, there's no doubt that the science absolutely is there, and we've heard um, from James just before and Tim that we cannot forget about climate change and how important that is. So it's not that there should be less focus on climate, it's more that there's an end to that, and that end is around biodiversity, um, and that's where I think native forestry plays a huge, huge part. What's really encouraging in a lot of the work that I'm doing and what we're starting to see come through is that a lot of what we do is driven by really boring stuff like frameworks and regulation. Where that's starting to move, though, is it's starting to include uh, natural, natural capital, considerations of biodiversity, as well as climate. So for example, um, the mandatory climate-related disclosures regime that's coming into New Zealand follows the task force on climate-related disclosures um, recommendations, um, the TCFD. Since Jan uh, June 2021, there's been another global alliance called the TNFD that's been formed, the task force on nature-related financial disclosures. So we're seeing this shift towards thinking more broadly about natural assets and natural capital, particularly amongst corporates in New Zealand and internationally, which is really, really exciting because that's where the opportunities to scale and accelerate thinking around ecosystems and the ecosystem services and then the role that native forestry plays in that comes into play. Similarly, um, many of you will be aware of the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is really focused on, on helping organisations think about how they accelerate reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. So that alliance is now starting to, um, to look at natural capital as well and understand what science-based targets for nature might look like. Um, because they see that interrelationship between climate and nature and the need for, for corporates and organisations to be considering the natural assets that they use and are integral to, to the deployment of their business models and that they, that they need to have some responsibility to either restore them or protect them or, or value them differently. Um, so that's really, really exciting that that, that, that connection starting to be made with the more boring area of frameworks and, and, and regulation, but it's starting to come through in the consciousness of how people are starting to talk about um, climate and linking it more broadly to, to, to nature, to biodiversity, and of course, to native forestry. Thanks very much.
Christina. Kia ora everyone, my name is Christina Hughes. I work for a global infrastructure fund uh, company called HRL Morrison. Um, they, are, they originally started in New Zealand in 1988, but they're now global. Um, we, um, we invest in large infrastru infrastructure assets around the world, so things like airports, roads, energy distribution, um, healthcare, data and telecommunications. Um, if you've heard of InfraTool, we're the fund manager for them. Um, they're a New Zealand listed um, infrastructure fund. Um, I'm based in Sydney, Australia, and I sit in the sustainability team. So my role is twofold. Firstly, I work with the, the deal teams to um, implement ESG or sustainability due diligence when we're looking at new investments. Um, but I also work really closely with our assets to help them implement sustainability in their operations. So that could be things like helping them develop a sustainability strategy, um, implement sustainability policies and procedures, and things like starting to help them understand their carbon footprint and all the other sustainability metrics that are becoming an expectation for organisations these days. Um, so one of our funds um, has a decarbonisation theme um, and one of the investments into that fund is a carbon farming and grazing business called Pastoral Partners Australia and it has a huge focus on native forest regeneration, biodiversity and also animal welfare. Um, so PPA follows a native forest regeneration methodology called human induced uh, regeneration or HIR. So this is a carbon farming methodology that is recognised under Australia's Emission Reduction Fund and it basically involves the regeneration, the natural regeneration of, um, of native forest through land management practices. So changing, changing practices where native forest was previously suppressed due to things like uh, grazing, feral animals, um, weeds, or mechanical, um, mechanical or chemical uh, suppression of, um, of regrowth. So the projects don't involve the planting of seeds or seedlings at all and purely relies on um, natural native forest regeneration. The cool thing is that HIR is also um, a methodology that allows it to go hand in hand with grazing of livestock. Um, so once you fence off the plot of land, but once the regeneration is at a certain height um, and level of robustness, I guess you could say, you can um, start to integrate um, grazing back into that particular area. Um, the level of carbon sequestration is, is quite low. It's about two tonnes per hectare per annum. Um, but I guess the benefit there is that um, you know, there's large tracts of quite cheap land that make this quite a valuable investment opportunity. Once you acquire that land, the cost to actually set up the projects are reasonably minimal. Um, and it's definitely a, a growing area of interest in Australia. It probably makes up around half of the, uh, the Australian carbon credit units that get generated today. One of the benefits of lots and lots of land. Exactly. All right, Oliver. Kia ora. Um, can you hear me all right? Kia ora. Uh, Oliver Hendrickson. I'm the Director of Forestry and Land Management at Te Reco, the New Zealand Forest Service, which is part of the Ministry for Primary Industries. Um, I sit here today as a regulator. My job um, and my team's job is to run the emission trading scheme forestry side of it. We don't do the industrial aspect, we just look after the forestry aspect. So we run a um, operation aspect that looks after providing assurance function for the ETS and compliance activities and education activities as well to ensure that people understand how to get involved in the ETS, uh, what their obligations, however, might be, um, and how make a decision for themselves whether joining the ETS is, is the right decision for them. Um, we work with a lot of landowners in Iwi and Maori around, around doing that because the ETS, as I said, is a voluntary scheme. Um, it's not like the speed limit of New Zealand. If you drive a car, you're gonna follow the speed limit. You don't have to join the ETS if you don't want to. And one of my role as, an e as, as, a, as a regulator is to try to put in place a system that is actually enabling. It's not just about rule creation and saying yes and no and you're a naughty person and I'm the carbon cop. Not like that, actually. Our role is to try to provide a system that will enable participation because we need more forests and we need people to think about that land use choice into a forest type that can help us reach our climate change outcomes. Um, it's been in the role for about, you know, I've been with MPI for about 10 years and five years in this director role. 
when I joined the ETS side, um, I, I look back, you know, <clears throat> I'll reflect a little bit on kind of the journey today because I think we're really good at beating ourselves up and saying we're doing a terrible job. And I don't think, you know, we've got so much, we're still looking up at the mountaintop and we're, we're not close. But I look back from where I started from in the ETS, nobody was planting a single tree. My team processed deforestation emission returns daily. That was their bread and butter. And in, 20, in 2018, how many hectares joined the ETS? 1,400 hectares, that was it. We're pushing this year over 200,000 hectares to join the scheme this year alone. And it was over 24,000 hectares last year. So we've proven something, one, we don't do very many deforestation emission returns anymore, which is good. Because people seem to forget at times what was one of our purposes of having an ETS. It was to stop deforestation. And that is actually starting to happen. So a little pat on the back for everyone around that, that we're starting to turn that around. We're not seeing the massive 70,000 hectares lost to dairy farms like we did in the 90s and 2000s. From that though, I mean, we've clearly proven that people will plant, the market will plant trees. And we've had a lot of, I guess you could say, in success in that aspect around exotics. Now, part of my program of work as well is also as the um, project director responsible for what has come out of the Budget 22 announcements. So as my boss Jason mentioned yesterday, Tiraco was provided with about $385 million of funding over a wide swath of work programs in the, wood, in the, in the forestry side right through to the wood processing and value chain aspect. Of that, there's about 30 million over the next four years to specifically look at how can we do more in the ETS? How can we actually think about pushing beyond incentives that are going to push for exotics? And how can we actually start to help landowners to have more opportunity around diversification of, land, of, of species selection? And not monocultures necessarily, but multi-species. And thinking about what are the, what, what are the what are the regimes that are going to work for those landowners to be successful with their land use aspirations in line with also helping us reach our climate change targets? So part of that program, and this is one of the things I'm really excited about, because I've, I've seen slides today and, and it was great to meet up with some people like Paul, who I, I got to visit the, the forest a couple of years ago that you're managing up in Totran, and you're just doing fantastic work there. And, and you had that one slide which showed the thinning regime and you saw the growth just coming on. It was fantastic. And that there is a measure of additionality. And one of the key things that the Paris Agreement has given us and what our budget funding has given us is how do we actually start to look into our existing old force that typically have not been eligible to join the ETS or be eligible for NZUs? How do we actually start to understand how land use management activities like Paul's doing with thinning and pruning or pest control, fencing, other things like that you remove those aspects out of the forest and the forest starts to come back, we can claim that. We can put that towards our NDC and we can thus also think about a way that we can put that through our ETS so that we can start to incentivize those sorts of land use behaviors. So that's a really exciting part. Now, the other aspect, and I haven't told Stephen this here and I'm gonna have a real shameless plug here. Look, this is a great audience for me because we're hiring, okay? <laughs> Tuaraco is going from 50 staff two years ago, right, to close to 200 by the end of this year, and we're pushing to 300 for next year. We have over 40 roles going on right now, and if you're interested in this max carbon stuff and interested around how land use activities, I'm putting up five roles in the next month, okay? We're also gonna be putting our science plan up very shortly as to how we're gonna approach this, these new carbon tables and land use methodologies. We want your input on this, but we also want good people to come and work for us as well. We have great jobs and we're fun to work for. And I'm just saying, <laughs> this is my demographic that I need to come and work for. So I'm putting it out there. Come onto our website, come work for us. We've got great jobs and great careers. Stephen. Thanks very much, Oliver. We'll, I'll send the bill to the minister. Yeah. A very expensive advertising bill, I can tell you. Uh, let me put a, um, a question to the whole panel that they can answer once at a, one at a time. And then what, what do you think the role of leadership is in this whole area? And we'll start over here. Oh, the role of leadership is, is massive, right? Um, I feel like probably coming from a forester's perspective, there's heaps of indigenous forestry leaders out there, but it's hard to tap into their knowledge. But when you do, 
it starts flowing and you know you just feel empowered to try and try and do more indigenous forestry plantings and management which is which is awesome but if you don't have that then you get sucked into the vortex and um, it just gets left behind so um, leadership is absolutely key at a real course level thank you Ian um, as a as a working unit of one, um, I, as a manager, I have very <laughs> I have great difficulty getting my staff to to work as hard as I'd like. Um, so yeah, I don't have a lot of uh, leadership or management experience. But from the point of view of leadership, generally, um, I would say uh, that yeah, I, I would promote uh, the idea of lots and lots of native plantings around the country because I, I, unlike production plantation forestry, it doesn't have to be big to be a good idea. You can have a hectare of native forest and it can be a really fantastic seed island, but you're also training the forester who's growing it and you're uh, exposing the natives to, um, the, the, the neighbours to, um, to something new perhaps. And so in that way you're a leader in that, you know, after you, like I've been there for 17 years and already two of the neighbours don't think I'm a twat. So, <laughs> yeah. Leadership. I don't think I'm a twat. Right. <laughs> Ian, but don't you think just what you've done is a wonderful example of leadership? Well, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Is, is yeah. I mean, <laughs> I do get told that. Um, yeah, but I also, you know, have a beer at night and sit up. I've put installed those benches quite recently so that I can pat myself on the back and tell me tell me what a wonderful human being I am, and it's and it's. <laughs> And it is extremely rewarding, but um, yeah, I do think that, that you know that that flows downhill, and people people drive past and see it and wonder what's going on, and so that, yeah, that is that is leadership, I suppose. I think applause is actually uh, due for what you've done. I really do. <laughs> Carry on. Yep. Um, so in Australia leadership in this space and really anything to do with ESG or sustainability has been mainly the domain of corporates in the private sector um, and they've driven a lot of initiatives where government hasn't been particularly progressive um, but we do have a new uh, government now who are much more um, supportive of these types of initiatives. Um, I was talking earlier um, to these people on the panel about um, Australia's commitment to 30 by 30 which is a global, a global commitment um, which countries can um, commit to basically promising to conserve 30% of land and ocean by 2030. Um, and the Australian government have, um, have admitted that they will need the support of corporate and the private sector to achieve that target. Um, WWF recently said that in order to meet that target, we need to reforest an area the size of Victoria and that cannot be done through national parks and reserves alone. So the fact that we've now got leadership from the government as well as leadership from the corporate and private sector means I think we're finally gonna make real headway in this space. Oh, that's great. Uh, just a point of order, if uh, someone from the desk outside hears this, I'm told that Slido pu push pushes through hundreds of questions. So far we've got none. <laughs> so I th possibly this, is, this uh, iPad's not working, so if someone could get a message to them. I've got plenty of questions for the group, but probably there could be some that might be worthwhile coming in online. Oliver. Oh, you can fix it for me. Here he is, just to fix it. All right. Thank you. Um, Oliver. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> um, lead leadership is absolutely essential in this space. It's... It just feels, if, 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 you, if you feel that there is a crisis on everything on the six o'clock news, it kind of like you're right. It is chaos and it is noisy. And leadership is about pulling a voice together, having a vision and being able to channel and, and to provide that vision for others to be able to follow up and come up behind and help, right? This is a wonderful audience. This is actually where you actually get to see the team that's gonna do the job. This is us, look around, say hi to each other. You should shake hands, you should have a beer later because it's you guys and you're gonna go off somewhere else and you might not come back together for some point physically. Leadership is essential. We have to have unity and we have to have that vision that comes through. It does feel like we're getting close to an election next year. Um, and and, I, and I, 
I reg I'm, I'm privileged that I get to have really great conversations with many people in the, in the audience far smarter than I or resources that they have that are just amazing or just the connections and, and, and deep knowledge of the land. It's wonderful and I'm really appreciative of that. But I don't hear a lot of unity or leadership in those conversations. So this group here, I understand, probably believes that trees are a big part of our future. Um, I've had some disappointing conversations in the last couple of years where there's a fair bit of vitriol around that. And I think that's really disappointing because I think we agree on about 95% of the issues and 5% of the difference actually takes up 95% of the air, airway. And, if you, and I've worked for many different governments. I've worked for National first. Um, you know, labor, I, the only one I haven't worked for is ACT. And I will one day probably. But um, I'll tell you one thing that they all have in common. If, if you want your politicians to take decisive action, they want, a, they want a strong voice. They want a strong wind behind them in their sails. If the noise is just like buckshot, they will move into a space and say, it feels like we need to compromise. Doesn't seem to be a direct picture through here. We're going to find the happy medium where everyone is not devastated, but pretty kind of grumpy. So I have a call to everyone. And it's, it's for everyone in this room, because we all have a role of leadership to spend. It is how do we come together with one voice? Right? What is coming out of this, this conference? And, and Stephen, you and your team have done a wonderful job to bring us together. So where do we go from this, right? That's one of my key questions for this group at some point, actually. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you. Just ask for more questions on okay. Slido. Yeah, we could get some more questions from Slido. There's not a huge number here yet. Um, I, I think that really begs the question, <clears throat> what, would you, what should we really think about doing as a result of this two-day conference? And, should we put some sort of challenge back to the government from all of us? Um, so let's explore all that a little bit further between now and when we close. Do you, have a, do you have a leadership yes, issue? Yes, uh, and perhaps that <coughs> challenge is a nice segue to what, how I think leadership, the role it should play or how it should be defined. And I think it's about being bold and not sitting still and constantly evolving and challenging because otherwise it's just management. And if there is not a constant evolution of ideas and innovation and risk taking, then it's very hard to progress, particularly when the, the issues and opportunities that we've been talking about are, are not easy. They're complex and complicated and there are loads of barriers out there. So in order for us collectively in this room and as a country to be successful, leadership really has to face into those challenges and constantly push against them almost. Um, without that, it's, it's very difficult to understand where we might go next. And I think with that as well, um, one of the things that probably hasn't come through so much is what does success look like? Because we're really not sure other than that it is a long way away from where we are now in a highly aspirational concept. Um, that challenging, innovative uh, leadership that is taking risks and forging ahead is going to, to define success much more easily than a, a management style that just sits and accepts the status quo. Thank you. Uh, one of the things we did <clears throat> hear about in the last um, presentation was adaptation and I think we're going to have to really think very hard about ad uh, adaptation for, for our pine forestry because you know almost all of our pine now goes in logs to, to China. Um, we've just seen a, a continuation of the leadership in China in the last week and we know that they're growing a huge number of trees. Um, you know you put trees in the ground today they're not harvested for say 30 years we might not have a market in China in 30 years, so we have to really think about adaptation for what we do with our wood, wood fibre. Um, I'm looking with a couple of parties that we've invested in and, and try to put together a plant that will make aviation fuel. We're starting to make it in the States now. This is Lanza Tech, and we'll, it's called Lanza Jet, and we'll try and do that in New Zealand in the future. It'll come, we hope, from forestry slash. Um, but adaptation, I think, is going to be really important for us. I think uh, maybe I'll just ask a few questions direct now. And Ben, maybe one for you. Um, <clears throat> you talked a, a minute ago that 
public-private partnerships. Did you want to expand on that at all or not? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so as I guess a representative of ECAN in part managing the forests and land, um, yeah, we get a lot of people coming to us looking to plant up our land for various purposes, mostly carbon farming, um, mostly permanent exotic forests. Um, we're on the Canterbury Plains, it's super wind exposed, there's not much um, remnant seed source. We're pretty dubious that that's going to turn into indigenous forest in 100 years and, that, and those investors are going to walk away and leave everyone happy. Um, and I feel like we're probably in the same seat as a lot of landowners where they're probably a little bit uncertain on some of these proposals. Um, but there are a lot of, lot of landowners that want indigenous forests on their land. And um, you know, people say that money's the barrier. Um, that quite often is, but after talks around this, um, the, the table, it sounds like there are investors out there that want indigenous forest. So I thought that possibly um, there's, there could be a space for maybe like an independent institution, where, whether it's government-led or whether it's, uh, you know, the Pure Advantage, Sunday Street Trust, Tyndall Foundation, could be a bit of a plug. Um, um, where essentially there's an independent pairing service that has landowners and investors that have mutual interests. Um, you have the experts in there, the restoration, you know, they're going to set a plan on this land parcel, how are you going to achieve those outcomes, they're going to put methodologies in place to get there, full, full blown plans, budgets and um, carbon returns for the, for the people long term. Um, and also like a long-term legal infrastructure that supports that um, because that's not currently something that's in place either that makes people dubious. So, Yeah, I think, I think there's awesome scope for that in the future um, and that would address some of the problems that we've come across. I think it's awesome that there's private capital that want to invest in this kind of thing but actually rolling it out is, um, yeah, that's a whole other beast and, you know, getting foresters out there, getting land managers to do this um, and empowering to, them to do that is, um, yeah, needs a little bit of support. Thanks. I, I was quite encouraged last night by, uh, by what Tim Flannery said, this, you know, when he was kind of chopped off at the knees as the Cl Climate Change Commissioner uh, and decided that uh, he would just crowdfund and carry on. And I think that might be something, you know, everybody's swamped, everybody's too busy. It could be something as a result of what we've seen in the last two days where we, we set a goal to try and get something done that maybe Oliver's getting asked to do at the moment and can't get round to it. Uh, we might get it done ourselves. So, Where are we going to get all this land from? Uh, well, as I mentioned, <coughs> subdivision, which m might be a contentious issue for some people, but, um, you know, everything's a trade-off. And... To me, you know, if we're going to be if we're going to be putting houses on on, de on dairy land and horticultural land, then putting it on marginal hill country is a better bet. And if you can leverage that to plant more forest, well, it's a win-win. Um, but when God made the earth, he, he did it in seven days, and obviously he didn't really think about it to, for, for very long because I think he did on the seventh. I, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, did it all in six. Yeah, I think he might have been, yeah. you know. On, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, but he should have put all the forestry in one place and all the farmland somewhere else, and then you could put the farmers there and the foresters there, but he sort of scrambled it. And, and so it's, you know, one of the things I think is that you need the right, per you know, it's right tree, right place, right person. So if you've got a forest, you need to have a forester. Whatever type of forest it is, you need to be that kind of forester. And if you've been farming and you have a, you know, big farm, not everybody is going to be able to change, even though you might appreciate that you have land that needs to go into forest. Uh, um, you might not be personally motivated to do it, and it might be difficult to, um, uh, you know, on big big chunks of land, it's not such a big deal. But where I live, where there's lots of small cut up bits of land, it's difficult to sell off small bits of land. But a small, as I said, you know, like corridors between SNAs um, is is a high priority area. Uh, I feel to plant. Um, if if, for instance, you could buy that piece of land, and reforested in natives and then be allowed to build there, which you wouldn't otherwise be allowed to do, but that's a reward for, for planting a native forest there. That would possibly be one way to do it. And the, the, um, you know, I don't want to get too, too into the weeds here, but basically if councils could be a bit more flexible on subdivision and, and how to split up land, if you can go to them with a proposal and, you know, I'd like to do this with that piece of land and this farmer is, he's happy to sell it to me. 
um, you know, make that easier because it's not easy and it's taken us a lot of years to get that subdivision through. But uh, as far as I know, we're the first person, first people in New Zealand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, who, um, you know, councils, a lot of councils have often, have, have for a long time offered subdivision rights if you protect an existing forest fragment in perpetuity, so QE2 or a regional council covenant or whatever. But we've, we've been given subdivision rights to protect not only forests that we're planting, but that we intend to harvest in the future. So our council recognises that, and I think that that is a, a breakthrough. That's a win -win. Yeah, yeah, Very yeah. Good. I'd like to see that more of that. Yeah. Oliver, do you think we're all trying to boil the ocean or, um, or really focusing on, on quality? I, I think you know, there's, there's a lot of things that need to get fixed. That's, that's clear. Um, and, and the other thing in this carbon space and carbon markets and stuff like that, um, you know, we're, still, we're still in kind of our infancy stage here. Right? So, you know, despite all the criticism, we've been running the ETS for about 12 years. Um, the gold market's been running for centuries, and other markets even longer. So, yes, things need to get fixed, but we also have a climate emergency and a biodiversity crisis. What are our top three things that we want to get done in the next five years? I think it's kind of a really key thing to kind of have that sort of vision, because there's a tremendous amount of resource in this room the public sector, in private landowners, and, and, and in big corporates as well. We all, need to have a, we all need to have that Southern Cross that we're aiming for, a common goal, and I think that would be, that would be helpful. Okay. Annabelle, um, what do we think the barriers are for corporates focusing their attention on biodiversity and, and, and natives um, moving away from siloed carbon and, and climate focus? I think it's it, the biggest barrier is the timing issue. So the, the time frames are all out of whack on so many levels. So we've got less than 10 years to, to face into this climate crisis, for one. Then we've got the native versus um, exotics issue in terms of sequestration, carbon revenue, um, longevity of species. So that's all out of whack too. And then we've got corporates who work on an annual budgeting cycle and have to think about uh, profits, revenue, uh, shareholder expectations, and, and how they maintain um, an enduring business in the face of all sorts of challenges they've got. So when they suddenly look at something like um, biodiversity, when they start looking at the trade-off between should they focus attention on looking at, at natives versus exotics, for example. They're caught up in that timing issue, um, both in terms of, of their planning cycles um, and the returns they expect, whether it's from a philanthropic endeavour, whether it's from um, offsetting the bad stuff they're doing, whether it's purely from a vested interest perspective in terms of how long they're going to be around for. So when you've got businesses, and, and this is the boards, and management making decisions, we're seeing it you know, with uh, zero carbon or net zero targets that are being set way, way in the future, and then nothing's happening. Um, companies are well-intentioned in this space to some extent but the management teams and the boards aren't going to be around when those promises are expected to be fulfilled. And so that timing issue creates a huge barrier um, for turning attention to things like natural capital, to thinking about biodiversity, to thinking about natural assets, and then of course native forestry. Um, and it's a really tough one to crack because those profit motives and those planning cycles aren't necessarily going to change anytime soon. Thanks. Um, Christina, um, here's one that's just come in, which I think might be worth getting your thoughts on. Um, what are the um, thoughts around, which is the best one here, establishing native restoration partnerships and training pathways to build capacity uh, and staff to undertake this important work? This has come in from Clear Beat. Got a view on that? 100%, absolutely. 
I mean, that's the only way these things can be successful, right? Um, we talked about the biodiversity credit scheme that's coming for Australia. That is going to rely on things like partnerships and working with our private landholders and training people up to do all this work because we have a lot of work to do and we don't have enough people in this space. So 100%, definitely. I, I was kind of thinking uh, earlier in the day uh, about, about what's happened over the past few days and to try and sort of summarise and crystallise them. I wondered whether, you know, we could take some of those themes, which, you know, is that um, we are going to have to spend between 10 and maybe 30 billion on overseas offsets. Um, Maori are disadvantaged by, by $7 billion on, on what they felt they, should, they were entitled to. Um, we know, it, we've done it to death, but we know the benefits now of, of planting native forests. So why wouldn't we go back to government as a, as a response from this, this whole two days and say, for goodness sake, just take that, take that seven billion, put it into native tree restoration. Yeah. Anyone disagree? I can say we got a 100% response, that's great, okay, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> um, there's another one here from uh, Vincent Herringer that uh, for Christmas, what are the climate criteria or judgments used in Morrison's investment decisions? Definitely, so Morrison and Co have a detailed sustainability framework that we apply across all aspects of our business. So that includes due diligence um, as well as ongoing operational management. Um, we do have a climate change and energy component to that framework. Um, and that includes things like measuring your carbon footprint, including scope three, setting net zero targets, developing robust pathways to achieve those targets, undertaking TCFD reporting um, and, and things like that. So we work with each of the companies that we invest in. Some of them are more mature than others and already have reached net zero or are, are well on their, their way to achieve it. And other companies which are quite new and quite large actually and still have not uh, measured their carbon footprint when we're looking to invest with them. So they're the big opportunities for us. We work with them um, to do this work and that's part of our minimum sustainability standards for all the investments we have. Um, and we, um, as part of this minimum sustainability standards, we also expect them to um, uh, complete a GRESB assessment each year, which is essentially a global ESG um, assessment, which rates you on your environmental, social and governance credentials. And we use that framework to help them improve on their ESG um, year on year. So climate change is definitely a big part of that. Great, thanks so much. Uh, and there's one here uh, from Wurramu Ruru, and I think, uh, Ben, you're the best to answer this because you're the youngest, I'm sure, of all of us here. What are we doing to promote and encourage youth to develop and create businesses which focus on the development of regeneration and workforce? Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question, and it's quite, quite challenging for me. Um, you know, I, I was really stoked lately just to just to learn about the Trees That Count, uh, that whole initiative and how that's kind of empowering youth and it's empowering communities to try and uh, connect with the Nahiri, connect with, you know, the trees and whatnot. And um, I think, you know, that's just an outstanding example of trying to get that momentum going. I'm not sure if there's enough of that out there, but that's, um, you know, that's a great start for sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any other kind of initiatives out there, but an awesome thought, and I'd love to kind of ponder on that a little bit longer. And <laughs> yeah. um, rather than a specific question, do any of you have anything more that's uh, burning that you wanted to get off your chest before you leave the leave the stage? Can I just yes, talk a little bit course. about um, PPA? And I mentioned it had obviously native regeneration, but um, a biodiversity and animal welfare focus. Um, so obviously um, initiatives, methodologies like human induced regeneration come with anecdotal um, evidence of improvements in biodiversity, um, but PPA um, have actually committed to doing this um, with independent advisors, um, academics in this space. So 
our investors in this particular decarbonisation fund. Uh, we're very keen to see um, experts come in and measure that, uh, that biodiversity improvement um, that we, we talk about um, when it comes to human-induced regeneration. Um, the other thing we're doing is um, working with livestock animal welfare experts to help us develop um, some best practice um, animal welfare lease clauses in our adjustment, uh, adjustment contracts. Um, as you'd be aware, I mean, farmers generally, uh, in Australia anyway, don't tend to use things like uh, pain management when it comes to dehorning and castration. Um, so some of our investors who are very ethically minded wanted to ensure that the grazing part of our business, um, I guess, push the envelope, I guess, in terms of improving these kind of situations for animals on our properties. So I guess that's kind that's of what great. makes it unique, yeah. That's good. Well, I, I, our time's up, sadly, but I'd like to thank the audience very much for, for their participation and thank each one of the panel for doing such a wonderful job. Thanks a lot.